Hello and welcome to Thursdays at the Museum. Thank you so much for joining us for today's program. I'm Christine Mark, the DIA's Manager of Volunteer Development. Today and next Thursday, we'll, we will be talking about a new DIA exhibition, the new Black Vanguard, Photography Between Art and Fashion. We welcome presenters today, Tana Jenkins, Ray Henney, Pamela May, and Sharon Harrell. Pamela is new to Thursdays at the museum. She is a photographer, a writer, and an art collector. She says the DIA is her happy place, and she's been a volunteer for five years. We also welcome our new presenter, Sharon Harrell. Sharon is DIA staff, and she works in community engagement with today's producer, Ian Rapninki. We encourage you to ask questions during the presentation. You can either type them into Facebook or leave a comment on your YouTube page. I will be monitoring the Q&A box for the presenters and reading questions on screen. This event is being recorded, so you can watch it again later on either YouTube or our Facebook page. Without further ado, I introduce you to Sharon Harrell. Hi. I'm Sharon, Community Engagement Manager at the DIA. Uh, thank you for tuning in. And as Christine mentioned, this month, Thursday at Thursday at Thursday at the museum is presenting our monthly tour in two parts. Today, the DIA proudly presents a virtual tour of one of its current special ex exhibitions entitled The New Black Vanguard Photography Between Art and Fashion. This extraordinary and thought-provoking exhibition is on display through April 17th, uh, 2022 in the Schwartz Galleries of Prints and Drawings on the first floor of the museum. The exhibition is in association with the nonprofit Foundation Aperture. The curator of the exhibition is critic and writer Antoine Sargent. The New Black Vanguard is a global movement of young photographers or image makers working in Africa or across the Africa, African diaspora who create contemporary portrayals of Black life. When we use the phrase African diaspora in this exhibition, it refers to the, the diverse individuals and groups living outside, the, outside of Africa who have been dispersed through either choice or force. So why the title? The New Black Vanguard Photography Between Art and Fashion. Fashion is image. Fashion photos that have appeared over the last century in print or social media have set the standard for what is beautiful and ideal, influencing our collective tastes and understandings of, of identity. These images have supplied the mainstream consciousness with positive and negative rep representations of beauty and the body. As the exhibit's curator, Antoine Sargent, states about fashion, images viewed critically, they offer a means of cultural reflection, tracking changes in societal attitudes, politics, sexuality, social and economic structures, and the value that we ascribe to expressions of individuality. Fashion images are aspirational. People feel affirmed or alienated by the likenesses that stare back at them. Historically, white culture or the white gaze, which promoted the attributes of white skin, thin European body types, and traditional gender roles and morals, has controlled these standards. So our next slide, building on the progress of black intellectuals and artists before them in the late 1950s and early 1960s, black artists challenged the standard of beauty as limited to thin white models and created a movement that promoted the beauty of African skin hair, and body types, which they named Black is Beautiful. 
They understood that beauty and image are power. The DIA's recently completed special exhibition of Kwame Braithwaite's photographs entitled Black is Beautiful focused on that movement. In this slide, the vibrant portraits and conceptual images of the young artists of the new Black Vanguard fuse the genres of art and fashion photography in ways that break down long established boundaries. From New York City to Lagos, Nigeria, these artists present fresh and diverse perspectives on photography and notions of race, beauty, gender, and power. Their work seeks to challenge the idea that blackness is homogenous, bringing together images from lifestyle magazines, ad campaigns, museums, and social media. This exhibition celebrates black creativity and the cross pollination between art, fashion, and culture in constructing an image. The image is large, over a hundred photographs, several videos, album jackets, and magazine covers. The exhibit features over 15 young photographers or image makers, along with 20 other emerging image makers, including some talented Detroit-based artists. Today and next week on Thursdays at the museum, we will be highlighting several of these artists. Thank you. And I will now turn it over to our presenters, uh, Pamela, Tana, and Ray. Take it away. Hey, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. We're all really excited about the pieces we're going to be looking at. <laughs> Um, I'm going to go first, and the first artist that we're going to be looking at is Campbell Addy. He's a photographer, and he's also a filmmaker. He studied fashion and communication at Central St. Martin's in London. His work has been exhibited throughout the world, and he's worked with editorial outlets, including, but not limited to, ID, Vogue, Financial Times, Dazed, Time, Wall Street Journal Magazine, Rolling Stone Magazine, and Garage Magazine. Awesome resume. Um, Addie grew up in a really religious household and came out as gay at 17 years old. He said publicly that it was a traumatic experience for him. He had to leave home and there was a strong conflict between his religion and his sexual orientation. According to his religion, he was a condemned man, but his values are deeply rooted in spirituality. And his work is reflective of his experience. His work is an examination of black bodies from an embracive paradigm. So faith, sexuality, and the beauty of black, often male bodies are hallmarks of Addie's work. He says that, sec that Mac, I'm sorry, he says that max that is such a hard word for me. Masculinity is a Western construct to push agendas or gender roles or even religion. He says, for me, masculinity is bogus. It's BS. So in one of his first um, exhibits, he says that one of the themes in his solo show was reconciliation. And he said that a lot of reconciling two very different parts of your life, a, a lot of peace, the path to peace is reconciling two very different parts of your life. And so with that, let us go to our first Addy image. There we go. Like all of the other photographers in the exhibit, Addy is a digital photographer and this medium allows photographers to capture the skin tone and color and light of our beautiful black bodies lustrously. Um, you can see in this image, we have a man wearing a red hat. There's a covering on his face and pearls wrapped around his neck with a cross dangling from it. It could be interpreted that the red and white coloring on the fabric on his face are emblematic of the conflict and the bloody battle that he waged with himself in reconciling his religious upbringing and his sexuality. 
you can see the thick stack of pearls that are nearly strangling him around his neck. And I think that that is symbolic of the asphyxia he felt with the religious dictates that told him he was a condemned man. And it's also possible that the face covering is indicative of anonymity or a wide ranging experience that allows any viewer to project themselves into the moment or, or the essence that's captured by this image. Um, so let's go to our next image. Oh, I love Tana, this. that first image is really powerful. Isn't it? It's, it's, so, it's powerful. so powerful. It's so it's very arresting in yeah, the is. gallery. It immediately drew me to it. Um, so another aspect of Addie's mission is to give voice and pride of place to overlooked youth cultures through highly emotional studio and steep street portraits that probe the intersectionality of identity. He's quoted as saying, fashion has always been a barometer for measuring privilege, power, class, and freedom. The fashion image is vital, like um, Sharon or Christine said in the intro. It's vital um, in visualizing minorities in different scenarios than those seen before in history. To play with fashion is to play with one's representation in the world. And he says, I think one can be really smart and tell many stories and change perceptions purely through fashion. And so, in this image, we see Addie pushing the envelope with gender roles and fashion. Here we've got a model. You see she's got this fiery red hair on her wig on her head. And then she's also holding a blonde wig and leopard print heels in her hand. And most conspicuous, I think, to the viewers is the brassiere on her bottom or their bottom. And this is Addie's way of poking fun at gender stereotypes in fashion. In examining these ideas of gender and blackness, artists like Addie are broadening our definitions of ourselves. And these expanded definitions make more room for all of us. And so Ray or Pam, you're up. Any comments actually, I'm supposed Christine, any comments? Oh, did I skip one? More Campbell Addy. And here we see again him playing. We've got a uh, representationally male model in a dress. And we have another instance of Campbell playing the gender and fashion. This guy really looks at the camera with attitude, doesn't he? Yes, he does. Doesn't he? Right. It's, it's real attitude, like, so what? Um, it's very interesting. This is me, take it or leave it. <laughs> oh, and here we have again, we have um, Campbell Addy. You have a man dressed in um, clothes that could be construed as effeminate. Another example of Addy playing with gender, pushing the envelope. Do we have one more image or is that our last Addy? I think that is our last Addy. Christine, are there any questions? I'm not, oh, sorry. Here I am, hi. hi. No, uh, we did, we had a, uh, oh my goodness, when looking at the, um, you know, the, the, mm, the gender identification and the idea of there and, you know, the clothes, um, perhaps um, showing us that that uh, gender um, identification is shown through fashion. And other than that, we haven't had any comments. Great. Thank you. Great. OK, Pamela. OK. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. My photographer is Nadine Ayura. She was born in London in 1992 of Jamaican and Nigerian heritage. And I mention her heritage because it influences her work, she says. She studied photography at the London College of Fashion. In 2018, she became the first 
uh, woman, first black woman to shoot a cover for Vogue magazine. Now, in the 125 year history of Vogue, they have never had a person of color to shoot a cover. So in 2018, she shot a cover of Vogue, but she didn't stop there. She has another first. She shot two covers of Vogue, the first black woman to do so. She shot the cover of American Vogue and British Vogue. She recently published a book, Our Own Selves, and it's a reflection, uh, images reflecting the diversity of beauty. Um, she has she really worked, impressive. Part, she was, she's really impressive. She is. She has worked for a few besides Vogue. She's worked for Dior, Fenty, Hermé, and Valentino, to name a few. And she is one of the most sought after fashion photographers working today. Her photographic inspiration comes from reading, she says, and the work of old school photographers film photographers. Her favorite photographers are Irving Penn and Richard Avedon. And what she likes about them, she said, was their use of backdrops and scenes, which is uh, emblematic in her work. She grew up reading fashion magazines, but couldn't relate to the models featured in them because she didn't see herself reflected in those images. Young Black girls whose skin color, hair texture, and body types were nowhere to be found in fashion magazines and let alone beauty, uh, um, not as beauty icons anyway. The exper this experience deeply affected her and influences her work today. She focuses primarily on the subject's identity and diversity. She is drawn to non-traditional faces with the mission of showcasing a new standard of beauty, capturing the uniqueness of different cultures. Ayura believes that beauty comes from within. Most important to her is challenging and changing traditional concepts of beauty. She uses imperfections and things that aren't typically considered as beautiful to showcase beauty in a completely different way. Layering, vibrant colors, dreamlike backgrounds, beautiful locations, and brilliant staging are hallmarks of her images. She said, I can see myself in my work. I want to give that platform to young black girls and women of color and show that beauty is not just one universal standard. Her professional and personal work is about the viewer being able to see themselves in the images that she creates. So what is beauty? Is it one thing or many things? Is it static? Is it dynamic? Ayura's images showcase the beauty that exists within Black culture and the Black experience. Beauty as diverse as the culture it represents. So let's take a look at some of those images. The art of resistance, Renaissance, I'm sorry, the art of Renaissance was taken in 2017 and it is the cover of the British Journal of Photography. And being this is a very important magazine in the world of photography. So having a cover on this magazine is very important. But the model, not your typical or the traditional um, image of beauty. She has dark complected skin. She has full lips. She has a broad nose and long copper locks, soft and feminine, dark and lovely, beautiful and powerful. The next slide, please. Joy as an act of resistance, 2018. 
This is glamorous, high fashion, and powerful. Ayura uses angles in her work to show perspective. The viewer is looking up into the gaze and the laughter of this model. It's simple yet elegant. The image conveys joy from the model's expression to the color of the dress and the sky behind her, which is complementary to the dress color. It is about the movement and the joy in this image. That is a great image. It's a really powerful title too. I yeah. mean, there's so much message packed into it. Exactly. Yes. Slide, next slide, please. Seashell. This is so interesting. I love this one. This is I mean, one of my so favorite pieces of hers. Um, Seashell is a model, and I think that's her name too. Here is another example or image that reflects her passion for showcasing, showcasing a range of beauty and expanding the definition of what is beautiful. Seashell's beauty is found in her smile, the gap between her teeth, which definitely wouldn't be a standard uh, considered beautiful as far as the traditional standards are concerned. Concerned, her fair, her um, light complected skin is very unconventional and her haircut. Her simple clothing is um, another way to draw the viewer in, I believe, because you could see yourself in that, that sweater. You could see yourself holding a flower. You could see yourself smiling. So I, I like this image. It's very unconventional. Next slide, please. Speaking of unconventional. Yes, absolutely. A wing, that's how you pronounce her name, I believe, a wing, 2017. This was not uh, created for a magazine or I don't, I couldn't find where it was created for any particular uh, platform. But what it represents is Ajira's collaboration and artistic uh, flair in showcasing beauty in a completely different way. Um, from We don't know if she's an angel. She looks like she has, well, not she looks like she has a, a body armor type of bustier and then the rubber boots. Creative so and unconventional, yet beautiful. Even her makeup is beautiful. And that, I, I, don't, I think that's my last slide. Okay, Are there, Christine, any questions? Oops, we went one too far, there you go. Oh, uh, actually going back to Seashell, um, one of the viewers commented on her um, vibrant blue eyeshadow mm -hmm. and uh, the question was, well, what do we make of that? It's unconventional. Self-expression. <laughs> a different type of beauty absolutely and it's it's a it's a form of self-expression in um in in my mind but um it it is beautiful and her haircut too yeah <laughs> really I'm, fun yes she and got the fun haircut is it possible for us to go back to the slide the previous slide this one? No, go go forward. The last slide. That's what I should oh, okay. say. This one. This one also showcases unconventional, unconventional uh, beauty for fashion mm -hmm. magazines. Her hair is cropped short. It's mm -hmm. natural. You don't often see that in fashion magazines, or you didn't. You do today. So that's another uh, mm -hmm. way that she showcases diversity and beauty. Yeah, and I think diversity and beauty, um, it has come come away since 2017. You know, you mentioned this was 2017. It's now 2022. And we're seeing more than we did five years ago. Okay, thank you. All right, Ray. All right, thank you. Thanks so much, Pamela. That was really interesting. 
So born in Nigeria, actually in Aba, Nigeria, Daniel Obasi is a photographer, filmmaker, and stylist who works and lives in the large city of Lagos, Nigeria. Lagos has one of Africa's most vibrant artistic, fashion innovative, and cultural communities. Indeed, some of them, some people consider it to be one of the world's prominent fashion centers. But ironically, Nigeria, particularly Lagos, is not gender alternative tolerant. There is persecution for individuals who do not adhere to traditional forms of gender identity. Nancy Barr, the DIA's curator of photography, observes that in his work, Obasi, Obasi is persistently creating a new language around Nigerian fashion, beauty, and personal identity. She notes that Obasi also is combating stereotypes. He wants to show masculine tenderness in opposition to the images of uh, young Nigerian men, which are often demonized and portrayed adversely in the media. Obasi is one of the young Nigerian fashion photographers who are trying to redefine identity, gender, and individuality through fashion and photography. Indeed, playing with this fluidity of the male identity is an important theme in Obasi, Obasi's uh, photography and films. He also seeks to create space for African men to express their sexuality and vulnerability. Fittingly, Obasi describes his work, quote, in my work, I try to create alternatives. It's a form of activism. He's also added, quote, creating an alternative narrative is my approach to dealing with societal issues. Can we the next slide? Thanks, Kathleen. In these two photos, Abbasi creates such alternative narratives, which challenge intolerance of various forms of identity in positive ways. And that's important in Abbasi's work. He shows positive images, which emphasize pride in African identity. As is typical of his work, here Obasi uses fashion created by designers in Lagos to achieve, in his words, better visual representations of disempowered communities. Next slide, please. This is an amazing photograph. It is. I love this picture. It it's, it's, a, it's very much image charged and uh, one could say politically charged. This photo is from Obasi's series, um, Moments of Youth, from a, um, it was a part of a 2019 annual journal called Primary Paper, which is a publication devoted to photography. The series appeared in an issue that had this, the theme of age. Obasi stylized the photos for this series and our curator, Nancy Bauer, describes they, these photos to be dreamy, playful, and delicately rendered. Those photos are to challenge the impression created by the media that Lagos youth are violent and hardcore. In this photograph, you have four men on a bow of a boat, the first one partic looking particularly proud and heroic. Ms. Barr describes the man as almost like a figurehead, uh, the, a protector of the ship. The men are beautifully styled in bright fabrics. Here, Obasi is creatively breaking boundaries and expectations about how a male figure and an African, specifically Nigerian, should be styled or appear in a photograph. As stated in an article about the DIA exhibition in the publication Detroit Art Review, quote, the bare-chested man in front in the 40 style slacks has a green gauzy fabric wrapped around his black marble torso. But while setting up a cool visual contrast, it does nothing to lessen the photograph's her her his heroic vibe. And it really is a heroic vibe. Next slide, please. This is really an interesting photograph. It's called Across the Wild Street. This photo is made for an outlet that caters to or is published for models. Obasi and the model, Jesse Joel, collaborated on this statement about rejecting the rules of a fashion shop. 
The obvious theme here is gender orientation. It's a photo of an African man who is particularly traditionally male looking in a brightly colored, traditionally feminine dress accented with frills. What makes this composition so interesting is that the man looks perfectly at ease. Indeed, he seems to be turning toward the viewer as though he's been interrupted on his way. Great next, observation. Next, is really, and I've seen other photos of this model, Jesse Joel, and he is like, you know, a traditionally muscular, very handsome, chiseled uh, male figure. And it's so interesting that he puts him in this extremely feminine dress and he poses him just like that. Uh, uh, it is uh, Obasi's way of positively showing alternative images in an African identity. Can we go to the next slide, Kathleen? Thank you. Also thought-provoking are these two portraits. Uh, both Obasi stylizes the men with these fashionable headdresses to create the mood. Uh, next slide, please. This is, to me, an amazing photograph. And this is another one of those photographs from Obasi's Moments of Youth series. This is really a highly interesting composition. You've got, you know, Pamela and Tana, you've got the stark contrast of this white headwear and the model's dark skin and clothes. Mm -hmm. The, the drawn-on lines are interesting. Um, they provide the sort of sense of structure um, and, you know, a posture. The white turban seems somewhat traditional, and the model is posed in a classic profile resembling maybe an Egyptian bust or, or pharaohs. The photo communicates regal pride and displays the beautiful silhouette of an African. Next slide, please. This slide is called Baff Up, which means to dress up. And the photo is a, um, is a from a series published in Natal, which is an African publication with African editors, writers, and contributors who control the representation of Africans and the African culture. The photo is a positive image of a black man accented by a headdress, Obasi stylized to create a certain mood. For me, this photo achieves one of Obasi's objectives, meaningfully depicting a vulnerable, masculine figure who is relaxed, contemplative, and dignified. Next slide, please. So these two photos seem to exemplify how Abbasi generally characterizes his work, and this is his quote. My subjects are seen as beautiful, seductive, and in some cases, otherworldly, as a way of transferring significance and authority to minorities who are victimized and often ignored in our society. He adds, especially now, when a lot of people are gradually losing hope in the future of our country, it's important to create visual stories that portray beauty and positivity. End of quote. Christine, do we have any questions? Uh, we have a comment from one of the viewers who said that Although we're we're talking about diversity, they've only seen thin models so far. Um, but I think we need to just wait a little bit on that one, huh? Yeah, yeah. It, it, and if we don't present many today, there are many in the um, exhibition. Um, yeah. Uh, so um, there is over a hundred photos. Uh, Fifteen different artists are featured. And there's just a lot of different kinds of images that we can only give sort of a flavor on. Mm -hmm. But there are definitely um, models who do not have that traditional thin model look. Absolutely. And one more thing was um, the self-identifiers. And I, I did uh, put in the comment box that we are trying to recognize the she, he, and they. And that, um, you know, there there is... Uh, people can decide how they want to identify their gender. And it doesn't have to be with he or she. It can be with they. Agreed and um, agreed. Thank you. So shall we go to Tana? I'm here. Um, but before I go into my 
artist, I just wanted to say that was a, such a fantastic presentation, Ray. I always enjoy oh, thank you, hearing Tom. yeah, what you see in the art. I always walk away from your, um, I don't know, lectures with uh, a greater understanding of the piece. It got I have to ton up credit, and I'm going to say it again, Nancy Barr, because she's been very helpful, I know, for all of us yes. in uh, helping us understand what these young artists are trying to communicate. Yes. yes. And speaking of a young artist, Bob Willis is fantastic. Agreed. Agreed. Um, and that's who we're looking at now. We have an image of Ariel Bob Willis on the screen. Ariel was born in New York in 1994. She currently lives in Los Angeles. Um, she has said that photography helped her to step out of her depression and anxiety. She was given a camera by one of her teachers in when she was 13 years old. She moved from New York to the South and the move from an urban environment to a rural environment just triggered her and she had a really hard time coping with that transition. But like I said, like she said, photography was instrumental in helping her to redefine the world around her and herself in it. Her artistic influences include Jacob Lawrence and Mary T. Smith among others. She's got the Jacob Lawrence Street Shadows print hanging in her bedrooms. It was a bedroom. It was a gift from her father and an image that she grew up with. And her work in camp is said to encapsulate some aspects of the Great Migration, which um, was the move of Black people from the South to the North and a topic that Jacob Lawrence examined in his work. Willis has said that she's been troubled by the history of Black image making in photography, and her goal is to break Black representation out of some of the limitations that have been imposed on it by the white gaze. And there's an interesting bit of history to give you context about the white gaze in recent history, actually. In 2018, I don't know if you guys have heard of the Taylor Wessing Prize, but it's a prestigious award that comes out of England. And all four of the photography's top prizes went to white photographers who photographed black people. And so all of these photographers won really handsome pots, 15,000 pounds, which is about $20,000 US. And they had their work displayed in the UK's National Portrait Gallery which is, as you can imagine, a huge promotional opportunity for artists. And that wasn't a unique occurrence, unfortunately. In fact, the same thing happened with the three top prize winners in 2017. And I was telling my husband about that, and he was like, so why is that a problem? And I said, the problem is that Black people aren't telling our own stories. You've got gatekeepers that stand in the way of us doing that. So the version of blackness that is represented is limited oftentimes. And I mean, like a good example is the Detroit ruin porn. We're all, most of us are, we know Detroit. We know Detroit is more than just the burnt out warehouses and the neighborhoods of poverty. But if that's the image that's blasted everywhere, then that becomes people's conception of Detroit. And the purpose of art is to open people's eyes and to show people new things. But when the same people have the power and limited perspective, there's no space for anything new to develop. No pun intended. Bob Willis has said, I love the idea of seeing Black people represented in an abstract way. It's important to me to continue to reject the notion that Black expression is limited or limiting. So one of Ariel's goals is to create space in the museum to have new, fresh dialogue. And we could go to our first photograph. I just, I like this. And I feel like I want to be quiet for a second so you can just really absorb it. Okay, seconds over. Union City, New Jersey, 2017. In a lot of her images, like this one, you'll see Black people almost as abstracts, as more than man, 
more than woman or even human, thereby promoting an expanded definition of blackness and of self. And how does she accomplish this? In Union City, you can see that the face of the model is covered. And in doing this, the artist hopes viewers will be able to see beyond the image of the model and to connect with the essence of the image. Curator Barr says this radical approach has been turning portraiture upside down. In a recent New Yorker essay on her work, journalist Antoine Sargent says her subjects styled in bright polychromatic thrifted garments pose against brilliant urban and rural backdrops. And they are in physically, not necessarily in this image, but you'll see in the next one. We can go to the next one actually. There you go. They're in physically challenging positions, but their bodies seem to be at ease, even graceful. Bob Willis said that living with depression can invoke a similar sensation. And Antoine goes on to say that in Bob Willis's photography, the body seems to be at once a shelter and a cage. In this image, we have sky as the person's head, giving it an almost surreal quality. I see it as sky as the person's head. You see his head's you know, bent over and you just got a straight line from shoulder to shoulder. And at the same time, the shape of the figure is obscured to the point where the person almost looks like a square. And let's go to the next image. There we go. We have New Orleans 2017. We have two models who have their arms extended and to form the shape of a square or an upside down U. Um, and they look some kind of geometric shape. And so what is the message here? You could infer that Ariel is trying to reshape the idea of blackness, of humanity, of sexuality, because in most of her, many of Ariel's images, you can't, you can't tell the gender identity. Um, is there another image that we can go to? In this image, we see that the model's face is turned away. And again, same as having the faces covered like we did in the last two or three images, the idea is that we'll focus on the essence and the emotion that is evoked by the posture and by the color. Um, so we'll just have a, a broader understanding of I don't know, life and humanity. Um, Antoine likens Ariel's work to Jacob Lawrence's Great Migration series saying Lawrence depicts colorful masses in motion, striving to transcend life's uncomfortable and ugly circumstances. In her own way, Bob Willis, who made the opposite journey from north to south, has used her photography to capture the same tension. Do we have another image? Ah, there this we go. So this interesting. Is that it's another really awkward pose and a good example of the body being a shelter and a cage simultaneously. That's and then amazing. we've got the bright, vibrant colors, which are a very deliberate choice um, to help people to be representative of aspects of the emotional um, spectrum. Is there one more image or is that our closing image? I think that's our last image. And I have no further comments on Bob Willis, um, really provocative artist. Really is, very yeah. interesting. So much different than what you uh, picture for fashion photography. Definitely. Tana, what did you say about the body being both a prison or a cage? And what else did you say? That was actually Antoine Sargent. He okay. said in Bob Willis's photography, the body seems to be at once a shelter and a cage. Wow, that's a powerful statement. I agree. Pamela? Am I up again? You up again. Unless there's oh, any questions, gosh. Christine, were there any questions or comments? No, not not at this uh not at this point. And it's 
I think uh, we can go ahead and uh, uh, Pamela, you could take it away. I can take it away. I'll stop swaying. I love this guy. I love him. He is so accomplished. He is just, it's, I can't, I can't find the words to describe him. Tyler Mitchell to convey beauty. Black beauty is an act of justice and you'll see why. Tyler Mitchell is a photograph photographer, a filmmaker and a skateboard enthusiast. He was born in suburban Atlanta in 1995 and is an only child. He attended private school and first became interested in photography in high school and began to take photographs at the skate park. Tyler attended NYU Tisch School of the Arts where he studied under Deborah Willis and started taking the images and making the videos that he himself wanted to see. He said there, and I quote, there was no viewing of the black body in a sensitive way. Tyler's work includes elements of street, docu documentary, and fashion photography. His images have been published in Vogue, of course, ID, and Fader magazines. He self-published El Piquette, a book of his images in 2015. He is inspired by the by photographers Jamel Shabazz, Carrie Mae Wings, and Gordon Parks. Tyler what came to national attention and acclaim after photographing Beyonce for the 2018 issue of Vogue, the cover, the inside spread, and a video. He was the first African-American male and the youngest photographer to ever shoot a cover for Vogue. Do we have that slide, Pamela, of Vogue? We do. It's, it's, it's one of the images I chose. Okay, to great. Okay. According to Tyler, I like to call him Tyler. <laughs> According to Tyler, his work has never been about pushing an agenda of great fashion images in the style of Richard Avedon and others. He said, it's always been about the person in the picture, my relationship to that person, and always has a social undertone. Mitchell's intention is to expand the visual vocabulary of race and space by showing black life as leisure, repose, and outdoor play. So let's take a look at some of his images. Let's start with this one here. This is a self-portrait. Pink is what drew me into this image. Pink. Sorry about that. I have to agree with you, though, that him placing his head in that position in front of the pink square really is an interesting um, composition. Here's the thing about pink. Pink has now established itself as a color of resistance. A color of resistance. Power is typically associated with masculinity and pink was once considered a masculine color. Can you believe that? Pink was oh my gosh, I love that idea. That's the first time I'm hearing that. That's such masculine an awesome idea. Color. And by default, powerful, right? Today, pink is androgynous and gender non-conforming. It's confident. You have to be confident to wear pink, right? Yes. The color is soft yet powerful. And the way the light is striking his face and the angle that he uses for perspective, his hands are much larger and his lower body is much larger than the rest of his body, his head and his shoulders. What message is that conveying? He seems to be relaxed, 
showing just um, being comfortable in its own skin. That's the message that I get from the pink. Powerful, cool, confident, and comfortable with who he is. Can we go on to the next slide, please? This is a great photo. Yeah. I love this one too. The, the title of this photo is uh, Hajit Hajab Couture. And it was the cover uh, for the article in the pink. A hajib is usually uh, very modest in nature and fabric. This one is flamboyant, artistic, powerful, uh, stylish. And it says to me, this is who I am. Here I am. Look at me. Unapologetic. Unapologetic. The next slide, please. Okay. This is untitled. The New Royals 2, Miami. And this was published for another magazine. In this image, this is a studio, highly stylized image from the couture outfit, the way she is holding her head, the background greenery. This to me says that she is a person of upper class, of means, mobility. And if you look at the purse, I believe I can't, I don't want to put my face right up in, it is a <laughs> Chanel bag, powerful. Um, style, class, money, and power is what this conveys to me. The next slide, please. Very similar, still powerful, but natural and more relaxed. Not as stylized as the first image, the shadows, um are simple and easy but still fashionable the colors are vibrant and it shows african-american in a different light next slide please oh there it is okay the slide on it, it would be the left the left i'm gonna slide yes. your left my right <laughs> the left is um, Beverly Johnson. She was the first African-American model to be featured on the cover of Vogue, but she was shot by a Caucasian photographer. To the right is an image produced, one of the images that was produced for the cover of Vogue by Tyler. Everyone knows who Beyonce is, right? But in this image, although she is a uh, cultural and global icon. In this image, she could just be your average, your average African American woman, your average black woman. Here she is with her her arms raised in victory. Um, she's wearing an iconic dress, a designer uh, dress, but there is symbolism in this image. It talks about, it, to me, it conveys her uh, cultural heritage, her pride in her culture. The colors are representative of the Pan-African flag, red, black, green, and yellow. And there was something else I wanted to say about it. It's an extraordinary photo, it really it is. It is extraordinary, and it connects up. Uh, Oh, the other thing I wanted to say about it were the cornrows in her hair. She is Queen Bee. She is a global, Nash international icon for many reasons. But this is an image that any woman, especially a Black woman, can relate to. They could see themselves on this cover as Beyonce or themselves. Do I have another picture? You do. I do have one more. And Tyler said that one of, one of his themes or intentions is to create a space where uh, 
he what he calls black utopia where it's safe to be black it's safe to um do the mundane tasks that everyone else does from sitting in the the grass among the flowers being with your friends just hanging out going on a picnic these are the types of images he wants to or he showcases in black utopia where it's a space that is safe to be black and it's in contrast i think not i think he said that this series came about the black utopia as a as a my mouth is dry i'm sorry as <laughs> a re um a counter narrative is what i'm trying to say these images of the mundane everyday lives, everyday behavior of black is a counter narrative to the photographs that we've been seeing in the media lately of um, negative images of black people. He wanted to show that black people aren't one dimensional, that they are multi dimensional. We're not homogeneous, homo homogeneous. There's a whole lot more than just mug shots. Yes, right. <laughs> and he said he was influenced, or I should say not influenced, but inspired to do the opposite, the counter narrative after he saw the Black Lives Matters protests, the video of George Ford, George, uh, George Ford Floyd. Um, he wanted to do, show a different aspect of Black life. That is so simple. But when you were explaining that to me, first of all, I never would have known that that was what he was going for. But when you explained that to me, that made me, it made my heart clench. It gave me tears. I mean, that is so powerful. Imagine a world where we could just go to the mail and not worry about our neighbors calling the police. I mean, beautiful, powerful, powerful, powerful. Go on a picnic, ride your bike, go to the skate park. So he calls it Black Utopia, and he wants through these images to um, convey that even in dystopia, there is still a Black Utopia within that. That's all I got. We're running against time here. Christine, are there any questions? No, not at this time, Ray. We can, uh, you can go right ahead with your. Is program. it okay if I go beyond? Okay, fantastic. Yeah, because yeah. yeah. I'm very anxious. This person is so accomplished. Uh, born in Switzerland, Nabsa Luba is an extremely accomplished image maker. And I don't have time to go through her credentials, but she's been commissioned by Nike to do major campaigns, series in The New Yorker. She's created fashion campaigns for Christian LaCroix. Eden and Dior. Um, and as you sit, see here, she states her inspiration. She says, quote, I am inspired by my origins and by the new creative exchanges infusing reality with my own sensitivities and experiences. Now her origins include her double heritage. Born to a Gideon mother and a Swiss father, Luba received her education in Switzerland. She now lives between Switzerland and Tahiti but her photographs are almost entirely feature Africans. Uh, with respect to her due her heritage, Luba states that um, I have always been characterized as the other. Whether I am too African to be European or too European to be African, in this unique positioning, I am interested in the politics of the gaze. Who is looking? Who is being looked at? and the medium of which this looking occurs. I think it's very powerful. Very According to her, accordingly, her, she has highly styled images. She explores African and African heritage through a Western lens. Next slide, please. Here you can see Luba's images have an anthropological quality that draws upon fashion and contains black figures draped in traditionally looking African garments and masks. They are not an expression of reality or real life images, but in a sense, they are a documentary fictions. Next slide, please. This is such an amazing photo. This photo, Shea Natatingo, is from a 
2017 series, Luba Shot in the Republic of Benin and depicts imagined narratives based upon the local traditions of voodoo, which in this hemisphere has become the voodoo. Luba states, quote, inspired by the visual codes and symbols of voodoo, I constructed a performative photographic series that reenacted important rituals. She did so by sourcing models from local villages and creating her own costumes and props. The title of the series is Wookie, which means, quote, the invisible and visible universe, all things created, living, breathing or not in the local language. And the word is descriptive of Voodoo beliefs, which are based upon the idea that spirits govern the natural and the human world and religious practices incorporated ceremonies that communicated with mythical gods. In this extraordinary photograph, you have the model moving his head, releasing the head strings to create this swirling veil. The model looks out with a serious, somewhat mysterious and bold expression. The, real, the reveal is a truly African image with a sense of this otherness, even supernatural, consistent with Buddhist beliefs and practices. Next slide, please. Here you have three proud African men dressed in a ritual costume on a rooftop in South Africa. This photo is a part of the series Luba called Tankoma, which means people stand up in the language of her mother's birthplace of Guinea. The fashions brand Eden produced this series and Eden focuses on sourcing production and encouraging trade in Africa. In the image, a group of masqueraders on stilts are posed on a rooftop in Johannesburg. It is inspired by the Namu tradition in Guinea that is known as the devil in the sacred forest. It is the belief that the devils protect the holy from for, uh, holy forest from bad spirits and communicates with ancestors in the sky and on the earth. Uh, Luba states, um, I incorporated West African masks, pieces of wood, fake hair, and African jewelry alongside uh, uh, Eden clothes. Many of the fabrics are similar to those found in the forest of Guinea, where the Namo are, are found. During her travels to Guinea, Luba experienced this ritual uh, performance, which takes place in a forest at night and features percussion sounds and dances. And there are many cultures in Africa that have similar rituals of men on stilts wearing masks, symbolizing gods or diviners, who, as referenced by their height, could perceive evil coming and ward it off. Next slide, please. This is a great photo. This photo, Mfana Lasuto, is from Luba series called The Kingdom of the Mountain. In this series, Luba explores traditional costumes, ceremonies, and rituals with an aesthetic that's formed uh, by fashion and the design, her designs. She orchestrates her images with historically correct geographical settings and includes various props to examine the attention between opposing forces, such as sacredness and, and secularity. Her process encourages a conversation about that which is normal in one culture and which becomes decidedly the other as viewed by the West. Lesuda is a small country in the middle of South Africa and was home to the Zulu culture. Lesuda is an economically challenged country. Its primary industry is garment making. Mfana means boy in the predominant Busuto language, which is derived from Zulu. The boy wears the traditional attire of the Basuto blanket, which is a thick covering made of primarily of wood, wool, excuse me. The blankets are extensively worn by both men and women throughout the country and during all seasons. What forms the narrative is the price tags. And what is the intention of putting these price tags all over the, the boy in the clothing? Is it intended to communicate how Western cultures would view this boy and his clothes? Remember, she, she takes images in the Western style. 
um, to you know the Western point of view. You know, are these clothes the boy in Basuto to the Western culture? Uh, is it for sale? Well, um, we've come to the end of. Actually, we ran a little bit over, and, and we've come to the end of our time. Um, Christine, are there any burning questions? No, there weren't. We've had some uh, terrific um, compliments, and uh, people are asking where they can watch this again. It'll be available on YouTube and also on the DIA Facebook page if you'd like to watch it again or if you would like to encourage your friends to watch it. Thank you. Um, uh, Kathleen, yeah, keep that up while I close out uh, today's. Um, uh, this is a Detroit artist, and I just I hate not to mention, he's one of them that's featured toward the end of the exhibition. It's a image maker uh, who, who made this very raw picture. Uh, his name is Ray Rogers, and I love the title, The Coney, Dylan, 9 a.m. at the Coney, waiting for a nine piece and fries. He is an image maker. maker. You can find him on Instagram, and he is part of a program that is collaborated with the Library of Congress to document America, and he is documenting Detroit. So thank you everybody for um, coming uh, next um, next week. As Christine had said, we are going to have part two. We'll have we'll feature six more artists, um, and I want to thank our producers, uh, uh, Ian Rapnicki, and of course Kathleen McRoom, who handles the slides. And we hope you all stay well. Take care. Take care, guys. Bye.